And the preacher's going to ask you Sunday, how many of you have invited anybody to church? Aren't you? So how many of you have invited somebody up to now? you got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you got three days. Better get on it. <clears throat> um, Janina's handed me this song. Let me kind of, it's an old song. It's in the red hymnal. And Friedrich Lehman wrote the first two verses. And I studied hymns and how they came about a few years ago. And they sung this song, I don't know, 15 or 20 years probably. And then someone went to an insane asylum, and that's what they used to call them. They used to call them insane asylum. And it was, I think it was in New York State to clean out a room of a relative that had passed away in this insane asylum. And on the wall was the third verse, this song. And the third verse says, Can we rethink the ocean field and where the skies of portrait now? For every stalk of earth at will, and every man scribe my trade. To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the hope. They'll stretch from side to side. So they went to this Lehman guy, and they, they put it. That's how the third verse of this song. Listen, listen to the words of this. We're going to do the verses together again. It's great. stuff. If you would, turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. It was good to see our preteen staying in with us tonight. 
Philippians chapter number 3. We're going to continue on with our study through this, this book, a wonderful book, rich uh, in blessings, and, and uh, what, a wonderful tr- what wonderful truths we've found so, thus far in God's Word. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Uh, started out the first two chapters were solely upon humility and it's still teaching it. The underlining theme of this book is that although it seems as though he's jumping off course, it seems like he's getting on to other things, he'll still go back and the, the whole theme of this book will be humility. Even what we'll talk about tonight, we'll be speaking about humility and trusting solely on Jesus Christ and his finished work on Calvary and it's nothing to do with us. Uh, we'll start reading in verse number one to get the gist of what's going on. We'll read uh, we'll preach tonight through verse 4 through verse number 6, Lord willing, and get as far as we can. And uh, and so before we start this chapter and before we read, Paul is dealing and warning against the Judaizers who were trusting in their uh, in their beliefs and, and trying to get in and twist things around from what he had taught on his first missionary trip through this area and uh, trying to convert them, if you would, or get them to pull back and add to what Christ has already done. And so basically he was saying uh, they were trying to teach the church at Philippi that uh, what you're believing is good, but you still have to bring back some of the Old Testament law. You have to involve it and bring it back. Uh, Although you're saved by grace through Christ is what they were teaching anyway, you uh, you still needed to pull the Old Testament and bring it together, live by the laws, and then you would be complete in Christ. But we have found through the teaching of God's Word and we already know that we are complete in Christ the instant we step into Him and He steps into us. He completes us. He completes everything about salvation. And then it is no more about what we can do, what we have done, or what we will do in the future. No holding on, no enduring to the end. Just as Paul said in verse number 1, he said, just rejoicing, just exalting the Savior for what He's already done and completed in your life. That's the only sacrifice left for us to give is the sacrifice of praise. So in verse number 1, he says, Finally, what he wants to get to, My brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you. To me indeed is not grievous. It don't bother me to preach it again or tell you again. But for you, it is safe. You need to hear this. He said, beware of dogs. And we talked about how the dogs were somebody that was persistent, like a hound that hangs up on the trail of a a rabbit or a dog. It just continues to be there. He's speaking of those that would uh, teach this other doctrine and bring this in. He said, beware of those people that would come in among you and take the time to try to distract you. He said, be careful, beware of those of evil workers. The word evil workers there means evil teachers, those that would persuade you to go wrong, using even sometimes the Word of God. Uh, And we spoke about even the JWs. They used the King James Version, the Bible that we would uh, stick to and we would reference to. uh, They use it, but the terminology is different. Their belief about what Uh, what the Word says is totally different. He said, beware of those evil workers or evil teachers. They know what they're doing. They're trying to subvert you, trying to get you to go in the wrong direction. And he he says, beware of consension uh, or or the cutting away of the Word or or taking away of what you've already been taught. He says in verse number 3, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit. Now, again, to reiterate... Uh, what he was dealing with is those that would add to Christianity and come back and say, now you're saved by Jesus Christ. Now you need to be circumcised. We talked about the problem with that. There's a huge problem with circumcision. (laughs) That can only be done to the men. So what happened to all the women? So what Paul is teaching them that we are the circumcision because we've been birthed into the family of God. We've been adopted into the family. God cut away the old man and now we have become new and now we are called the circumcision, uh, the born again. Then he says, uh, which worship God in spirit, not because the rituals of the law and, and the circumcision, and rejoice in Christ Jesus... Another thing that we do, we, we soul sell out to Him and rejoice in nothing more than Jesus Christ and have no confidence in this flesh. And there's some things that makes a difference or proves the difference in true Christians. Uh, they're born again. They've been adopted. 
They rejoice in Christ. They depend upon Christ and His salvation solely upon that, and they have no, absolutely no confidence or no trust in their own flesh to merit salvation. Paul continues on with that in verse number 4, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Verse number 4, we're going to talk about Paul's powerless pedigree. Paul's powerless pedigree. Uh, verse number 4 says, Though I might also have confidence, same word he used in verse number 3, in the flesh, if any other man think that he whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And what Paul is saying, if there is anybody around that could trust in the flesh, if it was about human merit or adding to something that Jesus Christ has already done, if it's more than just placing your faith in Jesus Christ, I for one could be the one that could merit it. But Paul goes on to say, but there's no hope in that. And, and he said, if anybody could trust in that, if anybody could do that, I could do that. And so what he's telling those people at Philippi, hey, if it was about that, I would still be doing what I used to do. I would still be persecuting the church. I'd still be doing what I was doing. And we'll talk about those things that he was doing before. He said, I would still be trusting in that. But there is no hope in human merit or human means. He said, if I can't do it, nobody can do it. Paul had a powerless pedigree. When I speak of pedigree, it's his life and things, and we'll talk about seven things tonight that uh, if we, we might not get there. Don't cut me off now. Don't cut me off. I know what people do when you say seven things. We'll never make it. I didn't know. I wouldn't have come tonight if I knew he was going to have seven points. We get to one. You know how it is. If God leads us in one and we quit there, we're good. We, we'll just do what God wants us to do. But I, I studied enough to have seven. Can I get a witness? What God wants to pull out, we'll, we'll let him pull out and then we'll be through. Um, Paul talked about seven different things, and we'll read those in just a moment. Uh, he speaks about seven things that he could trust in. If it was about the flesh, if it was about human era, uh, uh, effort, uh, Paul said, I could, I could give you some things and some credentials or pedigree uh, that would prove to you that I would be the one that make it or could make it. But I want you to see in verse number 4 Paul's response to these uh, Jews and what they were teaching. One man said this, uh, Mr. Barnes, a commentary that I wrote, he said that if Paul, or, or that if he, Paul, had ever had grounds of confidence in the flesh, which anyone could have, and that if there were uh, any advantage for salvation to be derived from such birth or blood or eternal uh, conformity or a change, a super change in their life, to the law, he, Paul, possessed it. And, and what the commentator is saying, if there's anybody that we could put a point, finger on and say, if there's anybody that could make it, we could point a, put a finger on Paul and said Paul could do it. But Paul himself says, I cannot do it. If you looked at Paul, and we speak about him as though he's as high as Christ sometimes, he's not that high, but he was a great man of God. Even before he got saved, uh, he was zealous after God. He wanted uh, whatever God was and whatever God had for him, he wanted that. And he was going about it in the wrong way wrong way but he was a zealous man willing to give up anything as we'll see later uh, for God and to be right with God but he was going about it the wrong direction if anybody could do it Paul could if any man born of woman could do it the apostle Paul or to attain salvation the apostle Paul could do it through his flesh if it was attainable by flesh if salvation was Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 11, He said this, He said, Among them that are born of woman, there hath not, uh, there hath not risen a greater than he, speaking about John the Baptist. Now we have two men here, one that commentators and everybody that's reflecting on the life of Paul and even Paul speaking about himself. Uh, we have two men. If anybody can measure up, if anybody can make it, these two men could make it. It would be the Apostle Paul. And Jesus said of John the Baptist, there's not ever been anybody born that was better 
than John the Baptist. And out of the words of God in the flesh, God said there's never been one born of man that's better than John the Baptist. So if anybody could make it, John the Baptist and uh, the apostle Paul could make it by their flesh. But Paul himself says, there's no, not even myself, I can't obtain salvation by the merit of man. There is a heavy scale of perfection that God requires that is higher than man can ever measure, that man could ever attain to, and that is the perfect perfection of God that God can only fulfill in Himself by sending His Son to this earth for salvation. God don't just uh, require perfection. He requires perfect perfection, and it's only found in His Son or God Himself. And that's how we attain salvation. Proverbs 16, 11 says, A just weight and balance are the Lord. The Lord is the one that measures, and He says there's nobody that can attain or merit except my son. So we see Paul's response to what um, these Jews were trying to say in verse number 4. He says, If anybody could do it, friend, I could do it. And that wasn't arrogant. Paul just knew his credentials and knew his pedigree but he also knew that his pedigree was powerless. What he had and what he had done was no good when he stood before God. You'll see that in verse number, verse number 7 a little bit later. I want to read verse 5 and verse number 6. It says, and this is speaking about his pedigree. Circumcised, this is what happened to him. Circumcised the eighth day, number one, of the stock of Israel, number two, of the tribe of Benjamin, number three, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, number four, as touching the law, a Pharisee, number five. <laughs> Interesting. Or, you know, the number five means death, and they, those Pharisees were dead. Although they were supreme in keeping the law, they were dead. They didn't know Christ. And verse six says, the, the sixth one, concerning zeal or excitement and thrill about serving God, persecuting the church. That's how far he went. And the seventh one, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That nobody could come back to Paul and say, I found something wrong with you, Paul. It's interesting here that we see seven things that the Apostle Paul says, and what does the number seven represent, church? Perfection, right? Or completeness. And we see here that Paul is saying, I was complete as far as the flesh goes. I was complete. I had everything to the, to the letter of the law perfect pertaining to the flesh. But let me, let me tell you something. Seven in man's eyes without eight is no good in God, God's eyes. Eight is the new beginning, and that was what the apostle Paul was needing. That thing we talked about on Sunday morning, he lacked one thing. He had seven good things, seven good credentials or a pedigree, but friend, he didn't have the eighth thing, a new beginning before salvation, and that was the, the, the new start that he needed, and that's what he got on that road to Damascus that day. Seven things that said complete in this world, but he needed the eighth thing to complete him. We see Paul's reasoning in verse number five. So, so they're saying... Let's go. Let's revert back to the Old Testament law, and let's let's add Christ. Let's take Christ. Let's receive Christ. Let's just. I mean, he's he's God in the flesh. Let's receive him. But let's take this Old Testament, and let's compile these things together, and then man, we're going to be a cut above everybody else. But can I can I tell you that Jesus Christ alone in your life makes you a cut above the flesh. <laughs> He is the new beginning and, and, it, and it's not re, re, resorting back to those things that makes us a cut above and just in the sight of God. It's because we've accepted that one thing, that number eight, that new beginning, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul gives these seven things and his reasoning uh, was, he said, uh, if we want to look at the outward appearances, let's look at what I have done. Let's look at where I'm at. Now, you have to understand that, you, that the Jews, which he was talking to and referring to, the ones that, or, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, not talking to, but the ones that were uh, creating some problems inside the church at Philippi, uh, 
you got to understand that those Jews trusted a lot in their, their, their heritage or their, their father Abraham. In Matthew chapter 3, verse number 9, uh, the, the Scripture says, We have Abraham, when speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the disciples following him and Jesus coming out and speaking to him and saying, Hey, I'm the one. They said this back to Jesus, We have Abraham to our father. And, and so the Jews trusted in their heritage. They trusted in their line. They trusted in being a Jew for part of their salvation. They, they trusted solely in that. They, they had a lot of emphasis on being a, a, a seed of Abraham, if you would. Another problem that they had is Jews that couldn't see Christ as who he was, but uh, it was because they had, a, uh, they had a lot of emphasis on the place that they lived. They had a lot of emphasis on where they, where they worshipped at. John chapter 4, verse number 20, uh, the woman says to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say, Jesus, you say, that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. <laughs> what she didn't know is those disciples said that. Jesus didn't say it. In verse number 21, Jesus said, The hour cometh when ye shall not, neither in this mountain, speaking of the mountain that they were in, in Samaria, which was Mount Gerizim, Speaking about that mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem where you say that we have to worship out, honey. <laughs> worship the Father. And what he was saying is it won't matter where you're at when you accept me as Savior. It don't, you won't have to be in, in, in Mount G Gerizim or you won't have to be in Jerusalem. You can be anywhere and worship God and thank God for that as Gentiles. He said it won't matter where you're at because uh, it won't... <laughs> It won't matter where you're at because of uh, the, the place or the location that you're at because you'll have me on the inside by the Spirit of God that would come later on, the comforter that would I'll send to you when I go back. He said, he'll come to where you're at. You don't have to go where he's at. Can somebody, ain't you glad tonight that he came to where you was? We couldn't get to him. We couldn't marry him by the flesh. We couldn't go to Massa. We couldn't go to, I didn't have the means to go to Jerusalem to try to find the, uh, the wailing wall, friend. The... <laughs> Glory to God. Thank God he came looking for me. He came to where I was at in a little bitty old town in Whitwell, Tennessee. When I couldn't go to Jerusalem, when I couldn't go to Israel, he came, the God of Israel, came to my little town and came to my heart, and now it dwells within us. He said, look, honey, it won't matter one of these days when you accept me. You won't have to go to a place you won't have to trust in your father Abraham. You can trust in me and you, ha you have connection with God the Father. So they had a lot of confidence in the flesh. They had a lot of confidence in who they were and their seed, being a, a child of, of, of father Abraham. And they also had a lot of confidence in their location and where they were at. But I want you to see a few things tonight. We'll go as far as God would permit I want you to look at, we'll, we'll start to dive into these seven. I've always wondered and, and wanted to look, and God gave me the time to uh, check into these and look into these. I've always wondered what all this means and, and had an idea, but I, I got, got the opportunity to look into it. And so we're going we're gonna to go as far as we can. And, and the first one is in verse number five. We'll cover the seven, either tonight or next week, Lord willing, and, and see what Paul's powerless pe pedigree was all about. I mean, if anybody could brag, Paul could. But his bragging had to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, first of all, he says, as pertaining to the flesh, as pertaining to what I am or who I am, he said, I was circumcised the eighth day. In Genesis 17, verse number 12, God told Abraham, every man child that, that parts the matrix you are to circumcise that child on the eighth day. Ceremonially, circumcise that child on the earth day. And it's still followed out even today. Uh, uh, we still do it in, in, in America and in many countries. We still follow those things out. Uh, but God uh, told them in that time to create a ceremony and, and to uh, circumcise the every man child on the eighth day. It's interesting, I've said this before here at the church, that they have found out, scientists have just now found out. <laughs> Coincidentally, 
that on the eighth day of a, of, a, of a child being born, that its blood actually flows a little bit slower on that eighth day than it does before or after, coincidentally. It's almost like somebody knew who created the body <laughs> and told Abraham in that time to do it, they, uh, to circumcise on the eighth day, which is, again, a picture of completion. Completion. God told Abraham to do that. And Paul was saying, I, my parents, uh, ceremonially, they have, they have fulfilled that in my life. The ritual of circumcision has been done on the exact day that God told it. It was performed. And, and as far as outward appearances go, it's done, it's complete, and I have that in my pedigree. <laughs> it's interesting that Paul, the Apostle Paul, the same one writing this, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 19, his, he says this about circumcision. Boy, it hit, the face of those, uh, it hit in the face of those Jews. He said, circumcision is nothing. Circumcision, and he had been, circumcision is nothing. That kicked the Jews back and said, do what? And then he goes on to say, and uncircumcision is nothing. <laughs> You can imagine the eyes of the Gentiles around and say, do what? The Jews are saying, do what? And what Paul was saying is neither one of them account for anything in the flesh. It doesn't do anything spiritually for you. It was just a ritual that they done in that time and has nothing to do with what God wants to do in your life right now. But Paul said, check number one off the list. It's taken care of. It's taken care of. Ceremonially, the Apostle Paul was correct. You couldn't go to Paul and find something in the Old Testament ceremonies, ceremonies that God or that Paul hadn't completed in his life. Done. Check it off the list. Ceremonially, his pedigree was spotless. Now, God had a lot of rituals and ceremonies in the Old Testament. Now, let me cover something very quickly. Let me ask you a question, church. Why is it that we use some things of the Old Testament law that you just read, Leviticus and Exodus? Why is it that those, those laws, some of those laws are used in today's time and we preach them and we touch, do not kill, do not steal. But yet even in the Old Testament, in, in the law, you actually couldn't eat shrimp. Can somebody help me? I'm glad all that's changed. Can somebody? Right? There was laws against eating shrimp. Why is it that we don't kill now, but we eat shrimp? Because the eating of the shrimp was a ceremonial thing that God established. And ceremonial laws can change. Y'all still with me? Ceremonial laws can change, but moral laws never, ever can change, right? See, well, ceremonial things is the things God told him to do to get pictures, to get types, to, to see what he was going to do in the future. All those things y'all been reading and thinking, what in the world does all this stuff mean? It was to confuse them, to get them to say, I need God. I can't do this. Exactly. That's what Paul was trying to tell these uh, Jews. You can't do it. And so that's what the Old Testament was supposed to do. When they read those things, it wasn't supposed to say, oh, I can do this, I can do that. It was to say, I can't do this, God, I need you. That's what the New Testament is about. We can't do it ourselves. It's not about our flesh. God, I need you. And so the Old Testament ceremonial things were to teach people that they needed God. And God instituted those things for those people at that time. And now we don't have to live by those ceremonial laws. Can I get some help tonight? Thank God in heaven. Yes. Every time I read it, we still got another Deuteronomy to go through. <laughs> Hallelujah. But those things change. Ceremonial laws can change. But moral laws, such as, such as thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, those are moral laws that God instituted way, way back there. 
and they're still as apt in our life or should be and they should be lived out and we still shouldn't kill. We still shouldn't bear false witness. We still shouldn't steal. We still shouldn't do those things today. We still, still shouldn't live uh, or, 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 or promote or go along with homosexuality. It was wrong. It was an abomination in the Old Testament. It was a moral law. It wasn't a ceremonial thing that went away like eating shrimp. Can somebody help? It was a, it's a moral issue. And those moral sins, moral laws, I'm sorry, moral laws don't change. It was wrong then, it's wrong today, and 10,000 years down the road, those moral laws will not change. It will always be wrong. Always. No matter what age and day we live in, no matter what te school teachers and textbooks and, 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 and politicians and, and, and television and, 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 and advertisements and soap operas, no matter what they say, it will always be wrong. They don't change more than once. And you'll, have, you'll have people in today's time, I've had them before. Well, preacher... You know that eating shrimp in the Old Testament was wrong? Do you eat shrimp? Oh, yes, I tear it up like pork and bacon. And... Absolutely. Well, you know that was wrong back then. Absolutely. I'm smart enough to figure that out. Smart enough. Well, that changed. Well, preacher, what about homosexuality? Didn't that change? What about fornication? Didn't that change? No. Because it's two different entities. It's two different things. <laughs> and the one that's trying to act so smart and so brilliant about knowing about shrimp being wrong in the Old Testament <laughs> ain't so brilliant after all because you're talking about two different laws. I felt like preaching. Y'all are a good crowd tonight. So those ceremonial things. If there's proof in what I just said, it's proof in what Paul says. Those things in verse number 7 are nothing but dung. They're waste. They're going away. And, 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 and another point. In these verses, you don't see anything that's moral issues that he's saying do away with. Just get rid of those things. But he does say on the ceremonial side, they don't do anything for it. Don't do anything for it. Jesus Christ... <laughs> was a ceremonial fix for mankind. Took care of all that eating shrimp, not eating shrimp, this do, don't do. Took care of all those things and completed that. And Paul said in his first thing in his pedigree, circumcise, circumcise the eighth day, brother. Checked it off the list. He goes on to say, out of stock of Israel, now, I don't think he's circum uh, ceremonial correct, ceremonially co correct. We'll get it out. His seed was correct. He was from the right bloodline. He says, circumcised the eighth day uh, of the stock of Israel. That word stock means kin. I'm kin to the right people. I got the right pedigree. If you look at my DNA, it goes back to the right group. I'm of the children of Israel. I'm a Jew through and through. In Genesis 27, verse number 27 through verse number 29, Isaac was getting ready to pass away. You know, it's been recently since we read through that also. Uh, Isaac was about to pass away and he wanted to bless his child. And it was supposed to have been Esau. You, know, you guys remember the story? Jacob, through the sub, uh, uh, subjection of her, his, his, his mother and, and trickery of his mother, the mother says, hey, i got a plan. Why don't you go in, dress up, put some, uh, put some hair on your arms, and your dad's going to think you're Esau, and so you'll get the blessing, and Esau will come in. It'll be too late for him. The story goes exactly like that. He's, uh, Isaac couldn't see. He blessed uh, uh, Jacob. And Jacob, uh, his, he was his name. Jacob means trickster. He lived that most of his life and, and, until God changed his name. And, and but anyway, he, Isaac blessed Jacob, which was supposed to be Esau. 
And through that blessing, he blessed the children of Israel from that point on. Through his seed, God blessed through Isaac the seed of Israel or Jacob. And so everybody born in his family was of the, or through that bloodline was of the stock of the kin of Israel or Jacob. And so what Paul was saying is, hey, my great, 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 ten, you know, a thousand great grandfather back was Isaac and Jacob. When it comes to kinfolk, we in. <laughs> I'm, I'm part of that bloodline. We're going to hear more about the bloodline, maybe even Sunday morning, the blessing of the bloodline that you and I have got. <laughs> Paul was saying, my bloodline's right. I got the right blood. I'm, I'm glad to say, spiritually speaking, I have the right bloodline. <laughs> when I, oh, man, when I got born again, I, I had a, a spiritual father who gave birth to me and put his bloodline on the inside of me, spiritually speaking, and I got the right bloodline from here on out. Paul was saying, I'm of the stock of Israel. The bloodline of Jacob, that blessing that God gave back then. By the way, that was the blood bloodline that they believed that any man, any man born through that bloodline one day would eventually be the Messiah. They believed that. They, they thought and they looked and... When Simeon, in Luke chapter 2, I ain't got this wrote down, but Luke chapter 2, Simeon was, uh, was, was, was in the temple. Y'all remember that story? I'm preaching about everything I know tonight. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be done in about two more minutes that way. <laughs> remember in Luke chapter 2, when Simeon the priest was there and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel? Waiting, they were waiting for the Messiah to be born. And here comes little Mary with her little two little turtle doves. Y'all heard me talk about this before. Those two little turtle doves comes walking in with this baby under her arms and says, Hey, Simeon, I got something here you want to see. I got somebody here, and they call his, they, uh, an angel told me to call him Emmanuel. Samuel, Simeon perked up. See, because he had asked God, and God, uh, God had gave him some assurance that before he was to die, that he would see the consolation of Israel, or he would see the the, the Messiah born. <laughs> Y'all in trouble tonight? Because I just I mean, stuff just. <laughs> he said, "He said I want to see the Messiah. And I'm going to. I, it's going to be in my generation. I'm not going to die till I get to hold." I'm not going to die till I get to experience knowing what it's like to have the Messiah before me. Can I tell you something else? That I believe that we are in the generation that we will see the Messiah. We will be able to behold Him coming in the clouds. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Just like Simeon had the desire to see the Lord come before he died, I believe that we're in the generation that we will behold Him in this generation. I'm ready to go tonight. Hallelujah. One of these glorious days, Thessalonians says, chapter 4 said, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the trump of God shall sound, and we that are alive and remain shall be called up together to be with them in the, in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with them. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Yeah. Simeon in that temple was thinking, Oh, one of these days... God's put it in my heart, and I think that I'm going to see the Messiah. And here comes this little virgin lady. <laughs> you say, wait a minute. He, she had a, a, a son in her arms. She was still. Here comes Mary coming in with those little turf. You, you know, I've, I've been said this church in a while. But it's so good, and it just fits right here. In that Old Testament, they had to have a bullock. They had to have a sacrifice. But if they were so poor, maybe like a carpenter <laughs> or a carpenter's wife and didn't have a whole lot of money, they were allowed by, by that Old Testament rituals and, and, and ceremony to bring two turtle doves, two birds, if you will. <laughs> I like it. 
So here comes Mary come bringing her two little turtle doves. Scripture, look at it, look it up, Luke chapter 2, a little bit later. She's bringing those turtle doves, got the baby up. See if you ain't going to believe this. This is Emmanuel. <laughs> Which, being interpreted, an angel said it was God with us. Simeon. And Simeon, help me, Elizabeth. It's the big one. What'd you say his name was? He said, Emmanuel, God with us. I can just imagine old Simeon taking a lap around the temple. <laughs> Shouting her help. Said, I knew God would come through. The sun is here. And I'm telling you, one of these days we're going to be bouncing all over glory and saying, I know it. Miss Joanne, I knew at the troubled times and the hard days we went through, I knew he would come. We'll be rejoicing around the throne saying, I knew he'd come through. I knew it was true the whole time. The Messiah came. And Mary says, Simeon, we poor. <laughs> we ain't got a whole lot. We'll let them go on. We'll get back to them later. Simeon said, or Mary said, we ain't got a whole lot. We're poor. My husband's a carpenter. I'd tell you the story, but I'm a virgin, but I got this baby. <laughs> Simeon said, do what? And you, and he's, you're a virgin. You gave birth to a child. And you called his name Emmanuel. There he went for lap number two. <laughs> he said, he said what would you say you had? She Mary, no doubt, said, I only got two little turtle doves to make my sacrifice. <laughs> it was the eighth day. Y'all read your Bible? I'm telling the truth. It was the eighth day she brought the, what was it, man-child that opened the matrix on the eighth day, ceremonially, correct Christ. Hmm. I'm just going to sit here for a minute. Holding those two little turtle doves. Holding that baby. And Simeon said, what you got? All I got is these little turtle doves. All I got went poor. <laughs> Simeon, no doubt, said, what's under your other arm? Don't you need a sacrifice? You don't realize it, Mary, but you got a bigger sacrifice under you. <laughs> You got a bigger sacrifice in your, in your other arm than what you got in this arm. Simeon said, hey, that baby you got, you can cast him. <laughs> you can cast them turtle doves to the side because of that baby right there. You ain't going to need them turtle doves no more. Can somebody help me, Jesus? I'm about to blow up. No need for no turtle dove. No need for no bullocks. No need for no lambs no more because, as John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away. You got the sacrifice that you need in your arms. Which takes away another reiteration of what Paul is saying. Which does away with all that ceremonial stuff. It's found in that baby that Mary came carrying into that temple. Right. <laughs> Glory. Hallelujah. Paul said, well, Simeon's waiting. Here, here, here. But this is far we're going to go. Y'all hang tight. We ain't getting to seven tonight, but we're going we're gonna to finish too sometime. Simeon was waiting for a Messiah to be born. Now that bloodline. He said, I, ain't gonna, I just don't believe I'm going to die. I just put it upon me not to die. Till I see the son of consolation for the Messiah born. Every Jew was birthed into this world as a boy. They, they were thinking the whole time, this could be the one. This just might be the Messiah. And Paul saying, I'm out of the stock of Israel, the bloodline of of Israel. And he says, check that off the list. I got that one. I got that one. Paul 
Paul said, I'm, I'm complete. Circumcised the eighth day? Ceremonially? Yep. My seed is correct. I'm of the kin or I'm of the stock of Israel. Let me give you one more. Can you all hang on to one more? One more. The tribe of Benjamin. He said, number three, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin, if you recall in some of our recent days of studying, Benjamin was one of the tri 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, Benjamin, Judah, uh, were the two tribes that stuck around in God's, God's, uh, God's area, if you would. The other ten rebelled and revolted against God and, and, and against David, and, and they ran and scattered, but not Benjamin and Judah. They stuck it, they stuck around. They stuck through the hard times. They hung, hung with God. And what Paul is saying with the tribe of, of Benjamin, matter of fact, the, the, the tribe of Benjamin, if you had the temple, if you had the temple on each side of it would be the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. They were next to the temple, as close as you could get to being in the temple. And, and, and any time you talk about the tribe of Benjamin, you, 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 you talk about people that have pled their allegiance to God through time. That have said, we're going to stick with God. We ain't bowing, we ain't bending, we ain't running, we ain't revolting. We're going to stick around with God. And Paul said, I am of the tribe of Benjamin. We've been doing it from the beginning. We've been where God wants us to be. We, we are known for our allegiance to God. We don't sway. We don't give in. We don't, uh, we, don't, we don't get out. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, if anybody could say, I got enough flesh, the Apostle Paul could say, I got enough flesh. If we stopped on those three, or if he stopped on those three, if you would come and get a song of invitation, if you would. If we stopped on those three, Paul is ceremonially correct. Nothing to falter. Nothing that somebody could say, no, nope, didn't do this one. Uh, uh, he, his seed is correct. He's of the stock of uh, Israel. And thirdly, his tribe. Is right. His, if, if you would, if you look at the tribe of Benjamin, they are known for their faithfulness. And what Paul is saying, hey, if you want to look at who deserves to be right with God according to the flesh, if it was that way, sarcastically, if you want to look at that, if you want to look at faithfulness to merit salvation, Paul was saying, look at me, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Before you were born, my fathers and forefathers were living for God, dedicated to God, next to the house of God. Outward expressions, we are in. But he says, no, in verse number 7, no, it don't work that way. I said all this tonight, and we'll say more about the other four a little bit later. Now, when you speak to somebody and they say, <laughs> when they say, what well, I'm trying to, if you ask them about salvation, you're witnessing to them, you say, well, how are you with the Lord? They say, I'm trying to. I'm hoping so. I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm a good neighbor. I've been baptized. So that baptism thing can link to the same ceremonial thing as the uh, circumcision. It's what I'm trying to say tonight for us as believers. When you witness to people, you can take them back to these verses and say, like, look, I understand what you're saying. I'm glad you're a good person. Glad you're a good guy. Glad you, uh, you know, you've been baptized and all that stuff. That's, that's the, in itself, it's good. But outside of Christ, it's bad. And then you can say, the Apostle Paul now... Philippians chapter 3, verse number 4 and 5 and 6 says that he had the perfect bloodline. He was of the right tribe. 
And he had more faithfulness than anybody else. And now Paul can't make it into heaven by that. Now do you expect to? See, it's not about our works of righteousness, which we have done again. It's according to His mercy. It's not about all those rituals. You Maybe tonight, as we spoke about a couple weeks ago, have you ever entered into the rest of God where you solely depend upon what Jesus done and say, I understand now, God, it's not about me. It's not about what I've done. It's about what you have done. If you've got a need tonight, let's all stand, whatever it might be. If you're here and you don't know about your salvation, you're not secure in it, you're not secure in what Christ has done, place your faith in Him and Him alone. Let God wrap you up in His love that they sung about a little bit earlier. Father, we love you. Lord, your word is unbelievable. The more we dive, the more we dig, the more we look, the more there is to look at, the more there is to dive into. God, I pray, Lord, that something we've said tonight has encouraged your people. Maybe it's shown us how to witness. Maybe it's shown us how to talk to people who think that they have some kind of merit, who think that it's about them. could be tonight, Lord, that even somebody that's truly been born again, they've placed their faith in you. They're still trying to wrestle with that flesh. They're still trying to wonder whether they really got it or not. Help them settle it tonight. Help them to be secure in you and what you've done. Again, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, I've enjoyed myself tonight. And I thank you, God, for your spirit leading and speaking. Your word coming alive to us. God, I pray, Lord, that you would build a work here at Delray, build a work in my life, our, our lives. Fuel us up and fire us up over your word. Bless every need tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've got a need.